Thank you very much for joining us here on TimForce.com. I'm so excited to have my friend Ed on here and my cousin Jeff Sheehan introduced us, who is one of the most followed people in the world on Twitter. I know from a marketing standpoint, he is. Um, Ed, welcome. And uh, thank you so much for being here and sharing your knowledge and experience. It's great to be here, Tim. Thanks for having me. Ed, uh, can you share with us? I know you're the president of uh, your, your, your own Ambrose Land in your consulting agency, but you do so much. You have so much experience. Um, can you share that? I can go through your background, but can you share some of the highlights of the group? Sure. I spent um, about 30 years in leading chain restaurant groups, both on the corporate and the franchise side. And then I flipped over and I led a uh, national nonprofit for 15 years. And then I decided that um, I wanted to really like my boss. So I went into business for myself as a consultant. <laughs> and I have a wide variety of things. And as, as we've talked, uh, when my son was 10 years old, someone asked him what his father did. And he told him right in the eye and said he gets things done. So that's, that's my consulting practice. I get things done. If you want something done, give me a call. I'm aware of uh, where you got something done in your past. Uh, a, I think it was about 68 locations that you inherited as part of a project and became your responsibility. Uh, can, you, can you help set us up on how, you know, what the situation was and how you turned it around, uh, that uh, situation? But could, do you remember the opportunity that I'm talking about? Yeah, I didn't have gray hair before that. Um, <laughs> I uh, took over a region in Northern California. We had 68 restaurants. And as uh, some people know, in California, it's a criminal offense for operating a dirty restaurant. Someone can actually go to jail. So um, I took a quick spin around the 68 and realized that I had problems. <laughs> and um, I had to put together a plan to bring the restaurants up to standard. And, and I think most people know a dirty restaurant is also pretty void of pride. Um, it's hard to have a dirty restaurant with a management and staff that's uh, proud. So I had to put together a plan and I decided that what I was going to do is I was going to establish a simple, consistent standard for a restaurant. I was going to rate them all green, yellow, or red. Green was good, yellow was in between, and red was poor. And so I, on my first tour around, I, at the end of the tour, I would say, this restaurant I consider green, or this I consider yellow, or this I consider uh, red. Thereafter, the second thing I did was I announced all my visits. I announced I was coming because I was more concerned with what they knew at the time than what they used. You know, if, if they knew I was coming, anything that was wrong, either they couldn't do or they wouldn't do. And if they couldn't do it, I could show them how to do it. And if they wouldn't do it, well, that's another kind of conversation. <laughs> um, so the third thing I did is I had regular staff meetings with my regional managers before the tour. And I would explain specifically things I was looking for. So I might be saying, I'm going to focus on restaurant, restrooms or product dating or ice machine sanitation. So everybody knew the date of the test, what was on the test, and all I had to do was execute. So the next thing I did is I started a weekly newsletter that went to everybody. And most people in the restaurant business know that the best place to hide something is on the employee bulletin board because no one will ever see it. So I made this newsletter a required posting and it was one of the things I inspected on the tour. So now I'm talking directly to the employees as well as the managers, as well as the regional managers. So there's no confusion over what I'm looking for. And then the fifth thing I did is I I never went on these tours by myself. I always rode with the regional manager. And before we got there, I asked her or him to tell me what I was going to find. I wanted to see what their assessment was. Wow. So I, I knew if I saw the same things that they did, we were on the same page. And if I didn't, then I had another kind of training. Oh, wow. So they would, before you did your inspection, 
you asked for a summary of what you're going to see in the location. Yeah. <laughs> That's and so great. then I could, you know, we were calibrating what, you know, it could be calibrating common sense or calibrating standards, um, just, just good communication. So before I walked into a building, I had shared the priorities with everybody. Um, everybody was ready. And those that weren't didn't care. And that really simplified things. You know, if you can find out who doesn't care, you've got a lot of work on. I had a deep conversation with the regional manager. I think my first visits were nerve wracking because nobody knew what to expect. But after that, they weren't nerve wracking because everybody knew what to expect because I was looking for the same things. Um, now, I make no bones about the fact that I was looking at artificial results because people were staging things for me. And here's how I justified it in my mind. Let's say on a scale of one to 10, a store normally operates at a level of five and we'll just take sanitation. So it's a, it's a five. And because they know I'm coming, they build it all the way up to an eight. Well, the reality is, is after I leave, does it drop? Yeah. Does it drop to a five? No, it goes to a six or a seven. So I'm, I'm using the two steps forward, one step back, formula. And there's also peer pressure. The employees say, hey, you got it cleaned up for him. Maybe you can, we can do the same thing for our customers, you know? <laughs> so there was a psychological element to it. That's awesome. What did you do when you were actually visiting the store? So you're in the car with the manager, uh, the region manager, and he's giving you this summary of what you're going to see. So you're physically going into the store as you stop in the park. What, what is it you do uh, as you're pulling up, as you're going to the location? So we pull into a, a regular parking space and I always made it a point to hang outside for a while because restaurant people have antenna, you know, they can see what's going on. And so he's here, he's here, he's here. You know what I mean? And so you, you just tidy up just a little bit. Um, I had a weed fetish. I, I, know, I, I, I would go and try to find weeds. And so it pretty soon turned into a game that, you know, before I got there, everybody weeded, which worked for everybody. <laughs> but I always started outside and I, I did two things. I made sure that I went to the dumpster and the corral or whatever, because that's the nastiest part of a restaurant is the dumpster. And then the other thing I would do is I would just stand out front and look, because a lot of restaurant people look at their restaurant from the inside out. And they really should look at it from the customer's point of view. And so I would stand there and look. And sometimes I'd be, sometimes the manager would come out and the regional manager would come out. And I'd just sit there quiet and look. And then someone would say, oh, that, there's a dead bush over there. Oh, you know, that the soffit is hanging. You know what I mean? And, and yes. so it became this kind of classic, oh, we're a customer now in our own restaurant. And this is what our customers see. Uh, so, you know. What I call this was a, a good tour route. And what I did was when I went inside, you know, it's mandatory to go to the restrooms. That's, that's what big shots do when they go to a restaurant. You know, you go to the restaurants. But I'd also check things like, is the spigot on the milk machine cut at an angle so there's no milk, you know, at room temperature? I Obviously, you check dates. Um, I'd eyeball the inventory. I have been known to dig in the trash once or twice, you know, just to learn about that. You know, and the old cliche that people respect what you inspect, Yes, I found to be true. So I call these my tour plus. So I was going to do whatever I was going to do in inspecting. And then there was a plus element on every visit. Now, sometime that plus element could be sitting down, with the manager having a cup of coffee, shooting the breeze because I was happy, he was proud, and everything was good. Uh, sometimes I helped. I am a professional dishwasher and table busser uh, with the best of them. Occasionally cook. I can take an order under pressure. Um, so, and sometimes I would also clean because. I never sat down in a dirty restaurant. Let me put it that way. In order for me to sit down and have a coffee with the manager, the place had to be clean. And I turned into a baseboard freak. 
Um, quarry tile baseboards, especially the sand color, look nasty when they're dirty. And if you clean baseboards right, you also know how to mop a floor correctly. And so my, my big three were, were baseboards, high chairs, and restrooms. And I found that if there were high standards there, they probably extended elsewhere. That's awesome. The other thing I do on a tour is if the staff wasn't in the middle of something, I would always, I would always talk to them because, you know, most marketing promotions are designed in an ivory tower. <laughs> Very few servers are asked about the mechanics, you know, and I wanted to find out how is this going? Is this working? You know, um, and, you know, restaurant people aren't shy. And many times I headed off a problem just based on an eyeball roll. You know, I'd ask a server something and she'd roll her eyes and that would send me on a path to try to figure <laughs> something out. Um, so, you know, over the course of a year, obviously everybody knew my name, um, but I probably knew hundreds of names too, because I was, I would see the same people and, uh, you know, thank them. One of the most interesting things I developed over time was what I called clues. I looked for clues in a restaurant with the understanding that I am seeing modified behavior, somewhat superficial. I wanted to find out what was really going on. So I'll share two of the ones that were most popular. I used to pay attention to who bumped into a manager. I know that sounds silly, but if you put a pole right in the middle of a pantry, the first day it was there, the servers would bump into it. But after that, they would, you know, no matter how full, they, were, they would avoid it. So anytime a server bumped into the manager, I knew the manager was someplace he usually wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one. And the other one is in the old days, the waitress ashtray was the best indicator of effective staffing. If you looked at a waitress ashtray and there were long ashes, um, you knew that they went back for a quick hit and they went back on the floor. If they were all smoked down to the bone, you know, down to the filter, that restaurant was probably overstaffed. <laughs> so those are the kinds of things that I used to do um, when I toured the restaurants. But with the, the, with the, without smoking today, how, do, how would you um, do that after the smoking issue? What, would you, what do you look for as far as uh, those telltale signs on staffing now? Well, I th I, the equivalent of that is probably the trash bucket in the employee break room or near the employee break area. Oh, oh. You know, and, and the, the other thing is they're still smoking, Tim. They're just not smoking in the break room. They're smoking outside the back door. You oh, know? I, so, see. You know, I see. <laughs> it's just a question of where, not when. So did we cover, is that, does that encapsulate basically what you did as far as in the inspection um, uh, at the locations during the trip? Yeah, I, I focused on two things while I was in the building. I really <clears throat> tried to focus on people. You know, you, you can't have enough good people. No one's ever had enough good people. So I was always looking for high potential people. You know, for the long run, I like to promote from within. And if I can spot that person early on, I'm way ahead of the game. What are some of those signals um, that you would look for or that would alert you to the fact that they were potentials to go higher? Appearance, uh, quick movements, not afraid to look me in the eye, not afraid to ask me questions, um, good work area, smile, observe them, interact with each other. I mean, the basic core of hospitality and productivity. There were certain questions I learned over time that people don't lie about. And so I'd always ask the manager about their staff. How's your staff? Because if the manager has a good staff, he or she is going to tell you that over and over. And they're going to tell you why and how and so on and so forth. And if they don't have a good staff, they're going to tell you that too, because it's a built-in excuse for whatever I find. You know, so um, I always ask that people. Uh, I always asked people that question. The last thing I did is I really relied on feedback. I asked a lot of questions. I, I just walked around the store asking questions. I mean, I pick up a piece of Canadian bacon and I say, is this the right thickness? I mean, it didn't matter what it was. I was asking questions because I had to execute policy or develop policy or develop priorities. And I wanted 
as much knowledge as I could. Um, and the boots on the ground always know something that those above them don't. I'll tell you what my last question was on every visit I ever made to any restaurant. I would say to the manager, if you were the president, what would you change right away? And I got some great answers there. Because that's a, that's another question you don't have to lie about. And of course, I got the uh, everything, my salary. Uh, I was, you know, I mean, I got some predictable things, but I also got some other interesting things. So, um, you know, specific. But people like asking, being asked that question. That's awesome. Because they think about it all the time. Yes. Yeah. My brother um, has uh, cooked over a million dollars worth of waffles uh, for Waffle House. And he tells me he's really proud that someone asked him one time years ago in his career about um, why he was doing something specifically with the forks and the and the and the dishwashing machine, and that has become a Waffle House policy. And he's really proud that that he had his little part in that. So I can I can see that question providing a lot of value and over time providing a lot of profit uh, for an operation. Yep. You've left the location. You might be in a hotel. You might be back in your office on Friday or Saturday, and you visited uh, many locations in the week. What do you do to follow up uh, from that process? We've talked about you visiting this, you know, planning your route, visiting and being within the stores, and how you know to turn that thing around, to turn those sixty-eight locations around. What did you do after you visited the stores and okay. prior to the next trip? The first thing I did when I got in the car with the regional manager is I asked the same question after every visit. And it was this, I'd say, what's the best way to supervise that manager? Oh. Because you supervise people, not buildings. Yes. And so between that store and the next store, we talk about the best way to supervise that manager. Because if the manager leaves, all the work that you've put in leaves with him or her. Now, if the regional manager's analysis march, match mine, we talked about different techniques to maximize performance. If it didn't, we would kind of thrash things out. And I'm not talking rocket science here. I'm talking about should you do announced visits or unannounced visits? If your BS detector is up, maybe you should do unannounced visits. You know, um, should the visit length be short, medium, or all day? You know, most people can modify behavior for three hours. So if you're not sure, you need to have a four-hour visit. So you see how, you know, people really are. And, and is it weekday, weekend, lunch? And what kind of visit would eliminate excuses or develop the manager? So those are the kinds of things we would talk about. And that, quite frankly, is my most famous question. What's the best way to supervise that manager. So if you found 50 people that I rode with in the car and said, what did it ask you when he got in the car? They would say, what's the best way to supervise that manager? <laughs> <clears throat> but more directly on your question, I try to develop themes. I think people absorb themes better than they do individual things. So the theme might be food handling or hospitality attitude. And it was always regionally based to start because I felt the things that were similar in a regional manager's store were evidence of his influence. Things that were different in each store were indication of the manager's influence. So I, I mean, I've actually, I actually got in the car after a tour and I said to a regional manager, I can find no evidence that you've ever been in any of your stores because there was nothing the same. You know, whether that's table tents or dating or, you know, it, it, the, the, re, the purpose of a regional manager is to develop consistency, you know, to have the best practices in store A, B, C, and D. And if, if you're not sharing best practices, then you're probably not doing your, your job. So, so theme was very important afterwards. And the third and fourth things were rinse and repeat. <laughs> I, I put things in the newsletter. I published the green stores. I would talk about the priorities, what worked. And I would have a staff meeting and I'd say on my next tour, this is what I'm going to focus on. 
what what I think took this program over the top, and it surprised even me, is I got these plaques, and I don't even remember. I'm sure they cost all of three bucks, and it it was a commitment to excellence award. And on my sec, second tour, I announced that anybody who got a green would get a plaque on my next tour. And when I walked in with that plaque, I was in shock. I had families there. I had kids skipping school. I had the mayor there some, in the small towns. I had the, the local newspaper there. I had managers cry. I had kids cry. I had mayors cry. It was, you know, it made me realize the restaurant business is a hard business and most of it is practice. And what do I mean by practice? I mean, we're, 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 you're doing your job, but when you have a great shift, there's no one there to see you. You know, you have to tell someone it was a great shift. And so what was happening was when I was doing the tours, it was a game. The lights were on, you know, the cameras were on. It was a big deal and you did well and you felt good. And it worked. Now, as you know, um, I jump started this program because I was having, I was struggling a little bit. And I finally said at a staff meeting, my definition of a restaurant is one that's clean enough to eat off the floor. I said, in the best restaurant in the next tour, I'm going to do that. Well, the hunt was on. Uh, I think we had more green stores on that tour than anything else. And um, a restaurant in San Jose uh, won. They were the cleanest restaurant. And I um, showed up in a white tuxedo. The regional manager had the high school marching band outside to greet me. I sat down on the floor and I, I was going to keep it simple. It, it, was, it was very difficult. I almost passed out. There was so much whatever going on. Dad, you, you put out a, a, a weekly letter. If people wanted to get on that letter and hear more about your experience, more of, of the accomplishments, more of the things that they can do to improve their life, and improve their business, how would they go about signing up for that, for that newsletter? What would they do? Sure. My uh, website is Ambrose Landon, A-M-B-R-O-S-E-L-A-N-D-E-N.com. And there's a Wednesday web blog link there and you can just sign up and you'll automatically uh, be included in the distribution. If anyone wanted to reach out to you, how, how would they send you an, uh, would you want them to send you an email or go over to LinkedIn and send a note there? What's the best way for people to reach out to you? Sure. My email address is ed-doherty, D-O-H-E-R-T-Y at outlook.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ed, for sharing uh, your experience with us today. And thank you guys for watching at timforest.com. If you're seeing this anywhere other than timforest.com or the YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Consulting, be sure to head over there and like and subscribe. Also, I'd love to hear what you thought about Ed's story and share some comments on that and uh, what you're doing uh, to run your multi-unit operation. So it's exciting, Ed. Thank you so much for sharing the value today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Tim. Awesome.